call the meeting to order, please. Agenda item 2.1, motion to adopt the agenda as amended to include the following. The CBT appointments under item 12, select committees revised 2018 council meeting dates under item 15. Motion please, Blanchett and Salt. No further amendments, all in favor? Carried. Agenda item 3.1, adoption of the minutes of the previous regular meeting of council. Motion please for adoption. Okay, Rammer and Torgerson. Are there any errors or omissions? No, hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Agenda item 4.1, we have a delegation this evening. Mr. Peter McCartney and, is that you? That's okay, if you, oh, before you start your presentation, any relation to Paul? I wish. <laughs> I like to claim that sometimes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Please just introduce yourself and uh, your um, position. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so my name is Peter McCartney. I'm the climate campaigner for the Wilderness Committee uh, based in Vancouver. And um, I would like to thank Council uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, to present our reasons for opposing the Kinder Morgan Pipeline and sort of the local, um, regional and global context for why um, the Wilderness Committee has been fighting this pipeline for seven years now. Um, I, I understand, uh, you know, being a community built sort of around the railroad tracks that Vilmot has um, a lot of this conversation around oil coming for, by rail versus by pipeline. Um, and to be honest, I, I, I find the, the argument that's often made by industry and, and proponents of the pipeline uh, a bit of a straw man in that uh, it, it, for a number of reasons, it's, it's not an either or, it's almost more of a, a neither. Uh, or both. Um, for, in terms of the amount of oil that we export uh, through British Columbia to the West Coast, the amount that comes by rail is really minimal in, uh, in comparison to the amount that we move through pipelines on this continent. And the amount of oil that Kinder Morgan is proposing to move uh, through its pipeline, 900,000 barrels a day, you couldn't move that on the tracks here through Vailmont if you tried. Um, and so beyond that, the economics of rail make it sort of a poor stopgap measure. Um, people have been moving, uh, rail, moving oil by rail because pipeline capacity has been um, used up in other places, but what Kinder Morgan's pipeline is, is for an expansion of the tar sands, um, for new projects coming online. And the truth is like nobody is approving um, a new tar sands project in thinking that they're going to move all of the oil by rail. The economics of it just don't make sense. It's just a stopgap measure that people use um, in the meantime. And uh, we saw as oil prices dipped in 2014, the amount of oil moving through British Columbia um, and through from Canadian producers to the United States actually declined significantly. Uh, and so really the economics behind um, behind that that version don't uh, don't support the argument that if uh, if this pipeline isn't built, it's all going to come through on rail and put our communities at risk. Um, but really, I think the the essence of it is that rail cars can be taken off the tracks at any time. And for a pipeline that you're building now in 2017, we'll have a, a lifetime of 50 years. And quite frankly, if we're still pushing oil um, through to the course and exporting it into the world in 50 years, we're gonna have a serious problem on our hands in terms of the global climate and the possibilities that, uh, that we have in order to um, to mitigate climate change and make sure that our communities are not put at risk. Um, but even if it were the case uh, that rail and pipelines were on the same, um, same track, the transportation companies could use uh, a different measure called neat bit. So at the moment they move diluted bitumen, which is, um, you know, tar sands oil, this kind of thick viscous oil. 
uh, and they dilute it down with natural gas at about 30%. If they just cut that down to 3%, they could move it on rail cars and it would be significantly safer. You know, it wouldn't ignite if it was there, there was a crash like we saw in Lac Magantic. Um, and, uh, and it would be much more environmentally uh, conscious because if it spilled, it would just kind of land in a pile <laughs> as opposed to a, a massive pipeline spill. Um, and I think, you know, it spills in this part of the, the region are particularly important uh, with regards to our salmon. Um, obviously, you know, sports fishers in Valemont in the area uh, rely massively on the salmon through here and Swift Creek being one of the most important runs in the province for Chinook salmon. That creek population um, would be put at risk if there was an oil spill anywhere along the pipeline route over the 900 water crossings that it crosses. Because once uh, the diluted bitumen gets into the water, it sinks into the creek bed. You saw this in spills like Kalamazoo uh, in Michigan in uh, 2010, where it coats the bottom of the creek bed. And you know from then on, you basically have to dig out the entire creek in order to clean it up. Um, and I think when you're thinking about salmon, you know, the rest of the region is all downstream of you here in Valmont. Um, you're at the confluence of three major river tributary, uh, major rivers. And, and I think there's a responsibility here as, as the folks who are at the headwaters to be making sure that we take care of, our, of the salmon in this province and to steward that resource. Uh, and unfortunately, Kinder Morgan has shown a, a real lack of care towards the salmon that, um, that come through this part of the world. The snow fencing that they installed in the base of, um, of Swift Creek, uh, 400 square meters of it, you know, putting aside whether or not it, uh, it worked properly, this company did not explore the full impacts of, um, of this innovative technology. When I, when I read the word innovative in using this, you know, I'm just kind of shocked that they would even use such uh, speak because it means untested. Um, they, they don't know the impacts to the salmon that this installed and uh, where taking away 400 square meters of their gravel beds to spawn would, uh, would result. And they did this all without permits um, in classic Kinder Morgan fashion. They, uh, they kind of expect, uh, expect permits to come afterwards. They beg for forgiveness rather than ask for permission. And, um, and they, they did it without the authorization of the National Energy Board or the BC Oil and Gas Commission, both of which they were required to, uh, to have before doing any work in a stream. Um, and so I personally, I don't think, and I don't think a lot of the people of this region uh, would ag uh, agree that you can trust Kinder Morgan with um, our most precious resource, the, the salmon that have been coming in, in here for, uh, for millennia. Uh, but to broaden from the regional scale and uh, the impacts of a spill that would have here on our economy and uh, on Valmont's uh, economy, more importantly, I think, and why I come to this conversation is the, the climate change angle. Um, we had a record three quarters of a billion dollars this year spent on wild, fighting wildfires in British Columbia that are getting more severe and more frequent because of the carbon pollution that we are putting into the atmosphere every day. Uh, we know that we need to constrain global warming to two degree, well, 1.5 degrees has the agreed upon safe limit um, that all the nations of the world, save the United States, have agreed to. But two degrees is really the maximum that we can go. And if we want to hold global warming to two degrees Celsius, we need to be f phasing out the tar sands over the next two decades. By 2040, we have to um, we have to not be mining any more uh, tar sands bitumen and exporting it into the world. And that's based on an economic analysis of which fossil fuels are going to be have have to be left in the ground first. And so, when you're talking about building a new pipeline with a lifespan of 50 years that thing is gonna to have to be torn down and abandoned long before it's even paid off uh, if we're gonna be able to make our climate commitments and ensure a safe future for our children. And so I just, um, 
at a time when, you know, hurricanes are, are rocking the Caribbean uh, at a greater and greater scale. Half of Puerto Rico is still without power. Um, here in British Columbia, our, our salmon are having trouble spawning because water temperatures are so high that the stress on their um, immune system causes them to get diseases. Uh, we're seeing wildfires raging across the province every summer. You know, this is not the time to be expanding fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and enabling the, the tar sands projects that would only um, be green lighted if this pipeline goes forward. Uh, finally, uh, you know, I think in terms of the climate conversation, I, when I think about the town or the village that Velmont is, uh, is portraying to the world and what they want to be, you know, there's a snowflake um, when you drive in here as, as the town symbol and the winter sports industry here is uh, a major contributor to the local economy. And I you'd think the council's done a lot of work to, to brand Valmont in that way. And it just really pains me to see, um, you know, what, what will happen if we continue to exploit our fossil fuel resources to the extent where we just continue to, uh, to expand the tar sands for the coming decades. And what happens when, you know, those glaciers that, uh, that people love to, to play on and, and see are no longer there. And the, uh, the winter economy that this town has, um, you know, may, will have to adapt and, and may look very different under a changed climate. And so um, I, I just, you know, I don't have a particular ask for, count, for council in terms of opposing the pipeline, but uh, that's kind of the, the lens that we view this through is this is really a, a fight for the future of um, of, of the planet uh, as well as the future of this region and the, the species and people who live here and depend on them. So um, the one thing I would mention is that Kinder Morgan is in front of the NEB right now with a notice of motion asking to override another local government's permits. Um, they city of Burnaby has required Kinder Morgan to go through the same process that any other uh, developer or proponent would go through. And they are currently being taken to the National Energy Board for hearings um, coming up next week to determine a way for Kinder Morgan. Kinder Morgan has asked for a way to override all local permits, including provincial permits. And um, I would love to hear uh, the council's position on um, being able to permit and, and grant and make regulations for a company that is coming through a local council. I think uh, Burnaby needs a lot of support and other municipalities in British Columbia, including the city of Surrey, have written in to establish just what, uh, what a bizarre proposition this is from the company. So um, that would be the last little piece that I would leave you with. I think I've taken my time. So. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and thank you again so much for having me in to, to discuss our uh, opposition to the pipeline. Well, thank you very much, Mr. McCartney, for uh, coming to Vail Mount and presenting your position. And so I'm going to open it up now for uh, councillors to uh, either uh, ask questions or ask for um, confirmation of anything that you may have stated. So it's open. The floor is open. Okay. Nothing? Councillor Reimer, nothing? I noticed you're making some notes. Oh, I, I did. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> um, one of the interesting uh, comments I heard recently, uh, uh, Peter, from one Peter to another Peter, <laughs> by the way, um, was by our new Premier, uh, actually, who um, who actually thought that with a discussion such as this, both proponents, the f for and the against of certain things, should be in the room at the same time to make their argument. And then a decision made about whether or not <clears throat> um, the particular project, which is Site C, should go ahead. Mm -hmm. I kind of liken this almost to the same kind of thing in terms of that there are two sides on this argument scientifically. And <clears throat> it seems to me it's not always as clear cut as each side makes it out to be. Um, 
most of your, I noticed most of your committee members, if not all, are from urban centers? Uh, that's not true, actually, I'm from rural Alberta. <coughs> Originally, but. No, but at the moment? At the moment, yeah. Um, we do live in Vancouver, Victoria, and Winnipeg, absolutely, but we're out on the ground. Uh, I would say we're, we prioritize our grassroots, you know, getting out into communities much more than um, than many other groups out there. And I think it's something that we really shine at. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm just thinking as an alternative, if that is done, you're, um, you, you live in an urban area where there are a lot of alternate types of uh, fuel to fuel transportation, which unfor <clears throat> unfortunately in our rural areas, um, we don't have. How do you propose that we would eventually be able to continue with our transportation needs in the rural area if the um, current source was eliminated? Sure. Um, and the truth is, well, actually, let me start with the story. So I was in Prince George last year, and I met a professor from UNBC who's got a pickup truck that he runs entirely on electric power, even in the winter. Um, and he's just proud and, and happy with it. And um, I think the technology has come such a far away that we have electric semi-trucks now. Uh, Tesla just unveiled its truck. Um, and that power, yeah, I know that v Vilmont has a, a geothermal potential here that uh, is yet to be explored and is just beginning to, to um, you know, power that industrial park that uh, that's being built, and so I would love to see you know renewable energy come online and power uh, the transportation needs of Vilmont. I think it can it can power the trucks that move through here. It can power the personal vehicles that people have, which obviously you know folks who live out on a farm are going to need a personal uh, way of transportation. Um, the folks that live in small communities will need a personal way of transportation and um, I think that there's absolutely nothing stopping us from converting entirely to electric power. But in regards to this specific pipeline, all of the oil that would move through there is for export. Um, it has you know, really very little to do with the uh, the energy that people are putting into their cars, the um, the fossil fuels that currently run our society, it would be uh, all shipped actually to California um, when the thing is, is built, if the thing is built. But I thank you for your question. And I, did, I, did that answer it? Well, <clears throat> it answered the uh, question. Okay. Any um, Councillor Salt or Torgerson, do you have any questions or Councillor Blanchett? Thank you for coming and presenting, you know, your your view and, and side of, of the argument. And, uh, you know, you've traveled a distance, so we appreciate that. And thank you very much. Okay. I want to uh, thank you as well. And uh, I just want to say that I didn't know about the 900,000 barrels a day. However, there is a pipeline here already, and it was built over 60 years ago. To the best of my knowledge, there have been no serious or major incidents. And I would say that in the 60 years that scientists have learned a lot more, uh, they have more knowledge, as well as engineers, and even the materials that would be used in a pipeline would also be improved over a period of 60 years. Now, um, I know that um, there is oil transported by, tr by CNR even now. And in July of this year, the Fraser Institute said that pipelines are two and a half times safer than rail. I travel by via rail to Saskatchewan several times a year. The railroad track, CNR, goes through Mount Robson Provincial Park. The railroad is up here, and the Fraser River is right down there. 
Now, it was only a few weeks ago that there was an incident, um, a derailment in a small town near Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, perhaps if that had been transported by pipeline, they would not have had to have been evacuated. Now, my understanding, all of our understanding, is that Kinder Morgan has received approval from the National Energy Board, from the federal government, and from the former provincial government. And for people to try to stop it now, as I said, I'm a realist, and I know that the product is going to be transported. And so I would sooner see it via pipeline than CNR or transport truck. We were all elected to protect and advance the interests of the people who live in Vailmount. I don't know exactly how many trains, but there must be at least 25 trains that go through Vailmount every day. And if it goes by truck transport, that also goes through town. So that places the people and the area in a real serious hazardous and dangerous position. If it's, um, you know, they, if even the Fraser Institute said that it's two and a half times safer via pipeline, then that's the best way to transport it. Now, I met with the Minister of Environment from Alberta a couple of months ago, and she said that their extraction of resources, their regulations and standards are the highest in the world. And I don't know how your group feels about the over 600,000 barrels a day that come up the St. Lawrence Seaway to Montreal from countries that have nowhere near the standards that ours does, that the province of Alberta does. And yet I never hear anything said about that. You know, so, yes. And uh, I just feel that um, if it goes by train, oh, and I did get stopped um, at the railroad tracks uh, a couple of months ago, and I saw oil tanker after oil tanker after oil tanker going by, I decided I would start counting. I still counted another 69 oil tankers, okay? So to me, that's a very serious hazard to the village of Vailmount. And it's probably a hazard to other municipalities uh, along the way to Kamloops. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to respond to that. Uh, with respect, Your Worship, um, I would like to clarify that the Trans Mountain Pipeline has spilled 82 times, uh, had a major spill over 2,000 liters in the last 60 years since it's been built. So um, I, I, I think that the, the safety of pipelines can really be called into question, and particularly new pipelines. Um, Keystone's pipeline was built just 10 years ago, and it's spilled again today. So I don't think the technology has approved improved as much as um, folks would hope it will. Um, I would just reiterate that be because a pipeline is being built doesn't mean those 69 oil cars are not going to come through Vailmont. It's not a um, either or situation. It is more of a both or neither situation. And that the thing that determines that is economics and that the economics behind transporting oil by rail are only getting worse and that uh, you know, you won't see by the end of the time that this life, uh, by the end of the lifetime of this pipeline, you will not see oil cars coming through Vailmont um, to, to continue to put at risk the, uh, the population and the resources here. Um, in terms of Alberta's environmental standards versus the rest of the world, I mean, we, you know, we oppose oil development wherever it takes place, but uh, Alberta is, and I'm from there, um, and so it's kind of an unfortunate situation in that they have some of the most carbon intensive, expensive oil on earth. And, you know, in many other places in the world, if you stick a pipe in the ground and oil comes up, um, that's all that needs to happen. But in Alberta, you have to clear cut a boreal forest, uh, strip mine the tar sands bitumen, and then boil it so that the oil emerges from, uh, from the sandy substance to the top of the water. Um, that takes a energy return on investment that can't even possibly compete with other oil from the rest of the world. I think conventional oils have get about 
19 barrels of energy back when they put one barrel of energy in, whereas Alberta tar sands oil only gets three energy uh, units of energy back for each they put in. And so um, just to address the, you know, it, it's Alberta that is going to have to do this first. Uh, deep water as well in terms of its incredible costs um, and uh, the economics behind it is going to have to go first as well. But I think uh, Alberta really has to look at where people's, um, where the future of energy is. And, you know, Alberta has a ton of talented people, um, geologists, pipe fitters and welders that could just as easily be working on solar panels, um, geothermal resources and wind power. And that uh, the, if, if Alberta can't do it, then nobody can. I think they have all of the resources and all of the talent that they need to make the transition to clean energy. Um, and you know what? If, if somebody else wants to supply oil, let them. Let them bet against the future of our children. Let them bet on humanity failing in its goal to stop climate change. I don't want the province that I am from and the country that I uh, reside in to be the one that is um, dragging the world back from being able to solve climate change. And that's, that's all I would say about, um, you know, the prospect of Albertan oil versus another. Thank you. Though, for the okay. Call. Okay. Um, you know, until um, a substitute is found for fossil fuels, I don't see that um, oil extraction can be stopped. Okay, I mean, um, the one thing that uh, uh, when CBC phoned me some time ago, I said I would like to know if uh, they wear bamboo or pure cotton, pure wool, pure silk, um, how many of them used a toothbrush this morning, how many of them used shaving cream this morning, um, do they have uh, um, deodorant or hairbrushes, whatever, those are all petroleum products. And so I should like to see an end to hypocrisy. And I uh, want to compliment you and thank you for coming and uh, presenting us uh, your position. But like Councillor Reimer said, I should like to see um, a presentation where the um, Trans Mountain or Kinder Morgan Corporation is present at the same time so that um, we can hear both sides. Certainly. Okay. I'm happy to be back for that. Thank okay. you for your comments. Thank you. And thank Anything you else, Council? Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much again for coming. And I'll take a motion, please, to receive the delegation from Peter McCartney of the Wilderness Committee. Is it just Wilderness Committee? Yeah. Okay. And uh, regarding the Kinder Morgan pipeline. Okay. Blanchett and Reimer. Okay. Any discussion, Council? Nope. Hearing none. All in favor? Carried. Item seven, reading file. No motion required. Is there anything that council wishes to bring forward? Okay. Agenda item 8.1, accounts payable. Recommendation that the October 2017 accounts payable report be received. Okay, Torgerson and Blanchett. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Carried. Agenda item 8.2, Direct Heat Use Committee recommendation. There is a recommendation here, and I'll take a motion, please, to move the recommendation for discussion. Blanchett and Torgerson. Okay. And it's open for discussion. I. Um, I just want to point out that $25,000 is a lot of money. And to me, the bottom line is that uh, there is a request for the village of Vema to raise the taxes, property taxes, to raise the $25,000. I don't know how council feels about that. We don't have money sitting around to cover this $25,000. And I also feel that the proponents of um, 
that are mentioned here who have uh, proposals uh, for projects out at the Vailmont Community Forest Land, that it should be their cost and not the taxpayers of the village of Vailmount. Any comments or thoughts? Yes? Um, I mean, it's always great to help and stuff, but um, this just isn't in our purview, I don't think. Uh, is there any way that they can raise some funds? I would think that the proponents who are thinking of uh, developing out there, they, it should be their cost rather than our taxpayers. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Councillor Salt? It looks like you have a question. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I guess I'm just a little confused because this, this is from our committee of council, our direct heat use committee. They're the ones that are requesting $25,000 um, to leverage grant funds towards a direct heat use study. Um, so I believe this is something that they've been working on, but at the same time, um, the, we've gone through our strategic planning and that has come forward. And there are a lot of things in our planning that are gonna be requiring some pretty important budget allocations that I find it difficult to um, consider putting $25,000 in our budget right now towards this direct heat use committee when we know that there are um, some other things that are um, moving along at a more prudent and, and uh, important pace. It doesn't mean that we don't still support our direct heat use committee. It's just at this particular time, um, it's not one of our top strategic priorities. Thank you. Anything further? So we do have um, the motion that $25,000 be included in the preliminary budget process in order to leverage grant funds for a direct heat use study or project. And um, if council um, has no further discussion or questions, I'm going to call the vote. All in favor of setting aside 25000 or including $25,000 in the preliminary budget process, in favor. Opposed? Okay, that's defeated. Agenda item 8.3, Columbia Basin Trust, Community Initiatives Committee appointment. Recommendation that Melanie Chitty be appointed to the Columbia Basin Trust Community Initiatives and Affected Areas Program Adjudication Committee for a one-year term. Okay, Torgerson and Salt. All in favor? Carried. And agenda 8.4, subdivision process. Motion please that the report from subdivision approving officer Gord Simmons regarding the subdivision process be received. Blanchett and Reimer. Any discussion? It's a very good report. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I was gonna say yes. I appreciated the, yes. the report. So. Good, all in favor, carried. Agenda item 8.5, fire hall lease, regional district Fraser Fort George. Recommendation that council approves the village to enter into an agreement with the regional district of Fraser Fort George regarding the use of the Vailmount and district volunteer fire hall property as legally as legally described as lot one, lot six, district lot 7356, Caribou district plan 10449 and parcel identification number 01269451 located at 1385th Avenue in the village of Vailmount. Okay, Reimer and Blanchett. Is there any discussion? Questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Number 9.1, bylaws and policy. Recommendation that the Village of Vailmount Enforcement and Adjudication Amendment Bylaw number 777-2017 be given first and second reading. Targerson and Reimer. Any questions? Yes, Councillor Blanc, uh, Salt. <laughs> So from my understanding then is instead of giving 15 days between the running at large, second and third, third and fourth, fourth and fifth offenses, we're allowing 60 days? That's what it appears, yes. Um, you, Mr. Davey. Your Worship, just to clarify that. So before it was, if it was beyond 15 days, it would revert back to the last process. Now we're saying we're gonna expand that to 60. So if it's the same offender on multiple times, 
it's not going to revert back. So if they have uh, running at large on the third offense, if there's another running at large within 60 days, it goes to the fourth offense, whereas before it was only 15 days. So this is uh, more progressively punitive. Okay. Councillor Torgerson? You're asking for a longer period to reset the clock? Correct. Is it clear? <clears throat> Abundantly. Yes, Councillor Reimer. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was reading that. It, uh, it almost reminded me of a comment that uh, somebody made to me a long time ago um, with respect to drinking and driving. And that was <clears throat> that because the first offense was such an easy way out, mm -hmm. he never learned. <laughs> yeah. And by the time that he actually sat up and paid attention, it was uh, like a lose your license, five thousand dollar fine. Mm -hmm. Had he been nailed with that right away, he may have mm -hmm. thought differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, dogs running loose are no small matter, especially if uh, you know they they kind of tend to be aggressive if they are and. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind seeing a stiffer penalty right off the bat to have people think twice before they even think about letting their dogs out of their sight and just having uh, areas that aren't properly um, contained, contained for these dogs. I would the council can suggest an amendment, can they not? Yes? They can, Your Worship. The reason why we took this approach was we benchmarked it with other communities, okay. so it is quite progressive. So if there was a challenge to this in court, uh, it would be seen that you know this is following best practices. You go through the warning, you have the first offense, and then second. But council could, if they so wish, okay. worship. Okay. Well, what is council's wish? Councilor Blanchett. What is the penalty for the first offense? I believe it's $100. $100? Yeah, $100. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does it say there? $80 for early payment and $120 okay. if the payment is late. Okay. Yes, Councillor Salt. Yesterday was a prime example. We happened to be, one person happened to be looking out the window at work yesterday and we saw three dogs running freely over by underwriters and running across Fifth Ave and we got scared someone was going to hit them because there was a car coming. They ran behind over Ty J and one of these dogs I know is a repeat offender. And so if we know that they're repeat offenders, are we having to catch the dog every time in order to find them? Yes. That's correct, Your Worship. It's very, the onus is on the municipality to prove. So in order to take it, we'd have to catch the dog, uh, hopefully get a picture, and then go from there. The problem is there are some dogs in the community that are very similar to others. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a few that are tending to be quite the issue. So it's believed that with this, it's uh, punitive enough to where you know, you're talking the fourth or fifth offense, we're up to four or five hundred dollars. So that uh, tends to be enough to have folks change their mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further questions or discussion? Yes, Councillor Torgerson. Just want to point out, Your Worship, that failure to license and then failure to attach that license onto that animal is also a 50 and 50. So basically, your, your first offense, should that animal not be licensed nor be attached to be a $200 offense, mm -hmm. which would, I think, almost cover staff time. Mm -hmm. Almost <laughs> covers staff time. Yes, Councillor Reimer. What is the actual cost of, um, of our bylaw enforcement officer picking up a dog, putting it in the pound, dealing with all this stuff, all of our time? What's the actual cost? Your Worship, I don't have the exact answer, but significantly higher than that. Uh, keep in mind, as soon as we're taking them to the pound, that's all internal. Um, so it's it's not 
inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I would like to uh, amend the recommendations and say that we should at least recover our cost out of it. And I don't think anybody can f fault us for wanting to recover our cost if, uh, if an animal is running loose and needs to be dealt with. It's agreed it shouldn't be a burden of the shouldn't the be a burden of the taxpayer. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a suggested increase or just actual cost or actual cost might cause more work? It works, yeah. Yes. It, although it would be great to have it neutral, mm -hmm. uh, that would be challenging to prove legally okay. what the actual cost is. Mm -hmm. uh, this cost is very clear to everyone. I mean, it's by law enforcement, so it provides that. Uh, should council wish they can increase mm -hmm. those penalties? Um, but again, this is just benchmarking on similar communities. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so what is council's wish? Yes, Councillor Salt. I say perhaps we just give this a try and see if that helps mm -hmm. alleviate some of the issues. And if we find it's still an issue, we can revisit it, raising the fees. Okay. Is that so? Um, everyone is fine with that. Okay. So we uh, do have the. Um, we have a, a mover and a seconder for giving this first and second reading. If there's no further discussion, all in favor. Agenda item 9.2. We have Village of Vailmount fees and charges, amendment bylaw number 778-2017. Okay, thank you. And a seconder by C Councillor Salt. And is there any discussion? No? Uh, hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Agenda item 10.1, Council reports. We'll start with Councillor Torgerson this time. We'll go backwards. <laughs> That's uh, very nice of you. Thank you. Uh, very late uh, week, two weeks. Um, I had a VARTA meeting on the 22nd, and I uh, was here with you, most of you, uh, meeting with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs on Thursday, the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. I'm here before you. Thank you. Councillor Salt. Uh, Thursday the 23rd, I as well attended a meeting with the Ministry Representatives of Municipal Affairs. Um, it was a very good meeting and uh, very informative, appreciated it. And uh, then yesterday, uh, attended a video conference presentation um, on the housing strategy of Columbia Basin Trust. And again, found that very informative and gave us some good ideas for moving forward. So really excited to start putting some of that into action. And I'm here before you all tonight. Thank you. Councillor Reimer. Went to a historical society meeting on the 21st and need to report back that the historical society really does need to I have some people step up to the plate and keep that society active and, and going. Uh, you don't have to be historical and you don't have to be ancient to be a part of that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that's my two cents worth for the historical society. And Thursday I was here at uh, the same meeting as all the other councillors were. Good, thank you. Councillor Blanchett? I had the same two meetings as Councillor Salt. Okay, thank you. Well, I really appreciated that uh, meeting yesterday with Mark Brunton from uh, Columbia Basin Trust, Affordable Housing. Uh, he gave us a lot of ideas and I got a copy of an email that he sent to, to a staff person today. And so, uh, Regional District Fraser Fort George two weeks ago, and uh, we had a, a meeting and dinner with City of Prince George Council, um, Investment Committee, Columbia Basin Trust, and Columbia Basin Trust board meetings last week in Fairmont. 
and we also met with the Tanaha Kinbasket First Nation and had an excellent meeting. So it's been a busy uh, couple of weeks. Thank you. I'll take a motion to uh, accept the reports, please. Salt and Torgerson. Any questions? All in favor? Carried. Agenda item 11, appointments to standing committees. And the uh, standing committee appointments of public works is councillors Reimer and Torgerson. Lease committee, councillors Reimer and Salt. Recommendation that uh, the 2017 to 18 council appointments to the standing committees identified above be received and that Mayor Jeanette Townsend be appointed as ex officio member to the same. Okay, Blanchett and Salt. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Appointment to select committees. The 2017-18 uh, appointments of council members to select committees. Columbia Basin Trust Community Initiatives and Affected Areas Program is uh, Councillor Holly Blanchett. Two, the Tourism Vailmount Committee uh, is Councillor Owen Torgerson and Councillor Salt as the alternate. Three, the Vailmount Museum Building Committee, Councillor Peter Reimer. Direct Heat Use Committee, Councillor Salt. Economic Development Committee, Councillor Reimer. The Housing Committee, Councillor Reimer. And the alternate is Councillor Blanchett. The uh, recommendation is that the 2017 to 18 council appointments to the select committees identified above be approved. And that the mayor be appointed as an ex official member to the same. So it's Councillor uh, Torgerson and Salt. Any questions? All in favor? Carried. Appointments to external boards, committees, and agencies. Appointments uh, 2017 to 18. One, Regional District Fraser Fort George, Mayor Townsend, Councillor Reimer, alternate. Community, Vailmont Community Forest, Board of Directors, Councillor Torgerson and Councillor Reimer. Prince George Treaty Advisory, Councillor Salt. Robson Valley Region Marketing Initiative Steering Committee, Mayor Townsend. Vailmont Community Television, Councillor Reimer. Trans Canada Yellowhead Highway Association, Councillor Sandy Salt and alternate uh, liaison, Mayor Townsend. Municipal Finance Authority of BC, Councillor Sandy Salt. Municipal Insurance Association of BC, Councillor Peter Reimer, alternate liaison, Mayor Jeanette Townsend. Local Health Liaison is Councillor Blanchett. And the Northern Development Initiative Trust, Prince George Regional Advisory Committee, Mayor Townsend, alternate, Councillor Reimer. Canoe Valley Recreation Committee, Councillor Holly Blanchett, and the Robson Valley Support Society, Board of Directors, Councillor Holly Blanchett. And the recommendation is that the 2017 to 18 appointments of council members to the above external boards, committees, and agencies be approved. Okay, Blanchett and Salt. All in favor? All right. Agenda item 14.1. The appointment of Deputy Mayor. Appointment of Deputy Mayor for the months of December 2017 through November 2018. We have Councillor Holly Blanchett. Oh, I'm not going to read these out. <laughs> you see them in front of you. I would just ask for a motion to um, approve. <laughs> Salt and Blanchett. All in favor? Carried. And agenda item 15, we have the council meeting schedule. Proposed schedule for the period of January 9, 2018 through December 2018. That's 15.1, recommendation that the proposed regular council meeting schedule for 2018 be approved. Reimer and Blanchett. All in favor? Carried. Agenda 17.1. Outstanding Council Resolutions and Project File Tracker. Recommendation that the list of outstanding previous resolutions and the Project File Tracker be received. Blanchett and Torgerson. All in favor? Carried. 18.1, no, okay. Agenda item 19.1, public comments on items considered by Council as part of the approved agenda. Are there any public comments uh, regarding this agenda? Yes. 
my name is Rashmi Man, and I live in the village Brahma. Um, my comment was just about uh, uh, council ruling on the direct Hades committee uh, recommendation. As a resident who's wanting to see geothermal happen, uh, maybe because it's uh, it could be great for Vermont to bring something innovative and, uh, and diversify our economy and bring jobs. Um, and also, I want to say, I, I, as a person who's also sitting on the committee, um, appointed by council, I'm, I'm a little unsure about our role hearing you guys have that discussion because uh, the way I saw it is, it's a resource. But yes, it's outside so-called village boundaries, but like the community forest, how the village is involved in that. The geothermal could be another resource outside the community, which could bring a lot of benefits to the village. Uh, just the same way the community forest is doing to the village. So I'm a little confused. <laughs> and uh, I think there's amazing opportunities. I think a lot of, there is a lot of media and focus on Belmont to see if this is going to go ahead. And if council supports a, a study being in place and things being in place for it to get rolling, you know, mayor and council could be in the media talking about the good news story. And, and so this is when we decided to pitch, uh, ask for the money to be ready for the study. It was about uh, not necessarily with the proponents. Uh, yes, I understand that it makes sense, but also like how could the village be involved and get some benefits, similar to how the community forest is bringing money back into the village, you know, the community. So that's how we saw the direct committee, uh, committee being involved and seeing potentially, because we've been looking at some ideas like if we have a utility that could be run by the village or something similar, some uh, kind of setup as there that could bring revenues back to the community. To, to the community and subsidize, again, like bring down taxes and stuff because of this revenue. So that's how we saw it. Uh, that's why we, I mean, yeah, that's how I saw how the, why the direct use committee is part of town, like a committee of council, even though it's outside the village boundaries. That's my comment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Jamin. Uh, Eugene Jamin. Uh, I am quite happy to hear that you're concerned about taxpayers' money being spent. But I'm also aware that not that long ago, there was a huge expenditure made in uh, our past um, administrative officer. And that concern was not reiterated at that time. I don't know if the final cost was far above what the cost of this 25000 is. And I'm concerned in something that could make us money is being rejected when something that costs us terribly um, was not considered. Thank you. Anything further? Okay. Motion to receive the public comments, please. Reimer and Blanchett, all in favor? Carried. We have a uh, motion to 20.1 to proceed to an in-camera meeting, please. That council proceed to an in-camera council meeting for consideration of three items per section 91C and K of the community charter to discuss matters related to labor relations or other employee relations. Negotiations and related discussions respecting the proposed provision of a municipal service that are at their preliminary stages and that in the view of the council could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality if they were held in public. Councillors Salt and Blanchett. All in favor? Carried.